All right, it's uh, 3.15, uh, let's get started. Uh, it's a pleasure to have everybody here uh, in this session. We're gonna address the, the role of uh, forage legumes in the Anthropocene. We have a great line of speakers today. Uh, each uh, speaker, we have uh, 20 minutes, uh, and uh, hopefully we have maybe 18 minutes presentation and a couple of minutes for questions. And I'll, I'll stand up at the 16 minute mark so everybody knows that you, you got two minutes to, to finish the talk. And uh, let's get started. The first uh, speaker uh, is uh, uh, Jeff Brady. Jeff is uh, associate professor uh, at the Texas A&M AgriLife Research in uh, Stephenville. And he's gonna talk about the importance of forage legume epigenetics in the Anthropocene. Jeff? Good afternoon. Um, we've been through two laptops already, and this is a laptop from the audience, and so we're hoping that this works. Keep a good thought for the electronics, and we'll see if we get through this. Um, this talk kind of started this winter when I was walking around in uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Research Center in Stephenville, bumped into my colleague Jim Muir in the hallway, and we had a discussion where he said, what is that called when a plant has a trait, but it doesn't express that trait? I said, you talking about epigenetics? He said, yeah, that's it. And we had this discussion about epigenetics. And so this talk, he, he, he asked me to you know, kind of have the same talk in front of a group of people. And so this talk is kind of aimed at that sort of level where you're aware of epigenetics probably we're not going to get into esoteric details about it and keep it practical if possible. So what is epigenetics? So the root of epi, you know, upon, over. So this is a layer of regulation that is somewhere above that of normal genetics, normal genes, um, in addition to or above presence of absence of a gene in a genome. And another definition, trait differences caused by modification of gene expression rather than alteration of the genetic code. So it's not due to mutation, it's due to something other than the sequence of the DNA. And there's only two vocabulary words here. One is euchromatin, and euchromatin is, you know, I have openly, open transcriptionally active DNA, and then the other vocab word heterochromatin, condensed, transcriptionally inactive DNA. And have a cartoon, so I'm <coughs> glad the, power, the PowerPoint's working now. It'll be hard to kind of explain all this without a diagram, right? So this is the kind of abbreviated version. There's many players involved in epigenetic regulation of gene expression, but we're gonna talk about like the two star players really, and the two star players are methylated cytosine residues, that's the one most everybody knows about, and then acetylated histone octamers. Um, in this cartoon, the DNA, double-stranded DNA is this black line that runs around the histones and then comes around here. Histone octamers are the blue blobs, methyl cytosine residues are the red dots, and the acetylated histone octamers are the, the green blobs. And you notice wherever the histone octamers have <laughs> acetyl groups on them, the octamers don't crowd together, they're spread apart, and it's because they don't fit together that well when they're acetylated. And then the heterochromatin is marked with cytosine residues. Okay. How's, do I need to speak a little louder? Gotcha. So we have euchromatin on the left, heterochromatin on the right, and it's associated with this acetylation and cytosine methylation of DNA residues. And in euchromatic regions, RNA polymerase can access the genome and, and begin transcription with transcription factors and carry out the central dogma of molecular genetics that DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is translated into protein. Those proteins 
result in plant traits. At the bottom, we have chemical or environmental stimuli that can shift chromatin to euchromatin or heterochromatin. It can go either way depending on the stimulus. The same stimulus can shift euchromatin to heterochromatin or heterochromatin to euchromatin. So it can go both ways even with the same environmental stimulus. So there's some establishment of protein and RNA machines that are involved in creating um, heterochromatin and then there's maintenance machines that are involved in maintaining that after it's there. And then processes like cell division can remove um, these epigenetic marks and shift over to euchromatin. And the gist of all this, how does epigenetics work? Well, the environment works at the level of gene. It works on individual gene loci and it either represses or activates in converting that genetic locus to euchromatin or to heterochromatin. And if it's converted to euchromatin, the gene is going to be expressed. If it's a heterochromatic region, the gene's not going to be expressed. Doesn't matter that the plant has the gene, still not going to express it. So why does this exist? Why epigenetics or why switch between heterochromatin and euchromatin? There's a few reasons. Um, when a legume seed hits the ground and germinates, it's not going anywhere after that. And so whatever happens at that site, the plant has to be ready for. This switching between heterochromatin and euchromatin provides some plasticity to the plant and ability to change its phenotype a little bit without changing its genome. And then genome organization is another reason. And I have, what, weird DNA calculations. So that means there's a lot of DNA in a cell. It's, it's crazy how much there is. So legume genomes are roughly equivalent to human genome in size. And we have about two meters of DNA in every one of our cells. So every nucleus in my body has about two meters of DNA. I've got 50 to 70 trillion cells in my body. You line all those up, if you could put it all into one molecule and line it up, it would go all the way around the moon and back 150,000 times. It's <laughs> mind boggling to me. I don't, I don't understand how that can be, but I've done the math, it checks out. So developmental uh, programming is, is another reason we have heterochromatin and euchromatin. So you can turn genes off when they're no longer needed. I have genes to make thumbs. I've got two of them and I've got two thumbs. I've got those same genes right here in the middle of my forehead and I don't have a thumb sticking out of the middle of my forehead, thankfully. Those genes have been turned off. Some of them. Some of those genes, the genes for skin, are present in both sites. <laughs> genes for bone, present in both sites. So it's not all of them, but the, there's a semi-overlapping set of genes that are silenced in that program for making a thumb. And then defense against spread of repetitive elements and viruses. Most eukaryotic genomes are just predominantly repetitive elements. These pick up and move around and they cause genome instability. And so in order to silence that instability, we have heterochromatin. We condense all those areas so they don't bounce around. When we first started putting transgenes in plants, the system shut down the transgenes. You would do a test, the genes in the plant, it's transgenic, it's there, but it's not expressing. Dad gummit, these internal systems have shut that gene down. So I'm kind of fascinated with twins, and this is a twin slide of identical twins. Their you know, genomes are identical in monozygotic twins. So when I look at twins, I'm instantly trying to say, okay, which one is which? And I can't tell for the top three sets of twins which ones are which. They look exactly alike to me. The bottom three sets of identical twins, I don't think I would ever recognize as twins because there's differences in them that prevent me from seeing them as identical. These two are on Oprah and one has a, a difference in the way she processes her food and stores that as fat much more readily than the other twin. There's a, one, has, one of these twins has cancer, the other doesn't, and I would never know by looking at them that one has cancer and the other doesn't, <laughs> except for this very superficial thing. Hair is absent from chemotherapy, and I look at those two and 
it's such a visual cue. I don't think I would ever pick them out as twins just because I don't have that visual cue of hair. And these two uh, sort of somewhat famous twins are old school mobsters from the UK, um, the Cray twins. They don't look alike and they actually had different sexual orientation and they're twins. And there's other cases like this where twins have different sexual orientations or vastly different behaviors and not all of that is epigenetic. So you might say it's dubious that the behavior came from epigenetics, but there are epigenetic studies in rodents showing not only is behavior epigenetically transmitted, it's transmitted over generations. There's studies in rodents where they pair a, s a smell with an electrical shock and they do this Pavlovian thing where every time a rodent gets this smell, they shock it. So pretty soon you can imagine you provide that smell. You don't have to provide the shock, the rodent freaks out because it knows something terrible is coming. Well, the progeny of those rodents exposed to that smell freak out because there are epigenetic marks that can be tracked. So this is like a memory of trauma from a previous generation that the siblings or the, or the offspring rather are you know, reacting to. So that's a little mind boggling to me. <sighs> so bringing this back to plants a little bit, um, how, do, how does this relate to plants? And so we've known for quite a long time that, that epigenetic factors are impacting plant gene expression. You know, famously, uh, flowering, vernalization response in flowering, there's a gene called flowering locus C that's a repressor of flowering. As long as that's being expressed, plant's not gonna flower. After vernalization treatments occur, that gene is epigenetically downregulated and it's a repressor, so if you downregulate that, you're removing the repressor, and so the flowering program is turned loose. The meristem turns into a floral meristem. Some of the other um, biotic and abiotic factors, temperature, drought, and uh, repetitive heat, cold, salt, stress, herbivory, basically all these things leave epigenetic marks in the genome that are heritable. And then Lately, since we've been around, there's things like air pollution is getting worse and worse. We didn't invent air pollution. There have been volcanic explosions and all that going way back. But um, air pollution around cities, depending on where you're located with your research, if you have a lot of air pollution, that's impacting your plants that you're working on. Uh, polyfluoro alkylated substances last in the environment for a super long time. Um, pesticides, I bet everybody here has used pesticides or herbicides. That causes epigenetic changes toxins from metals, different chemicals, all these things have an impact. They have an epigenetic mark that they leave on a genome and it's kind of flexible, but sometimes heritable. So where was your seed grown? If it's in, a, it's in an environment that is radically different than where you're growing your plants, there's an impact of where those seeds were grown, the environment, in that area where the seeds were multiplied, marked your seeds that you're using. So if you bring seeds from a vastly different environment to a new environment, you still have marks on those seeds from the original place of propagation. Um, and there's these temperature and precipitation gradients across everywhere in the world. And so if in Texas we got some seed from Bismarck, South Dakota, we got kind of simpler, similar precipitation in those two locations. But the average daily temperatures are radically different between Texas and Bismarck, North Dakota. And so there's gonna be these cold marks on the epigenome when we, trans, when we start growing plants in Texas, they're adapted to growing in the cold. So you're gonna have altered phenotype basically. So some practical considerations you know, where was the seed you were evaluating or using grown and how different is that environment from the, from the destination for use? So if you're growing seed for a distant location, you know, how, how different is that from your environment? You know, and the phenotype, when it arrives at this different place, is, is gonna be impacted from where you grew that seed. 
how long does it take for epigenetic variation in a given ecotype or cultivar, et cetera, to reach an equilibrium at your work site or restoration site? It's a practical thing if you're, if you're getting seed from a plant material center and growing it and you're evaluating it right away, are you really evaluating the genetics of that seed or are you evaluating the epigenetics in addition to the genetics of that seed? What is the impact of last year's weather on this year's seed progeny? Should that be considered before moving the seed to a new location? We've had crazy weather in Texas over the last three years. In 2021, it rained and rained and rained. In 2022, it didn't rain at all. In 2023, it's raining all the time. So we've got you know these epigenetic marks from these different environmental factors that are impacting the seed that we're producing. Does your plan of interest have a narrow genetic base? Should you attempt to create epi alleles specific to your site or application? You can create de novo variation by turning loose all those retro elements in a genome, those repeat elements. If you remove the epigenetic regulation, those things are going to move around. They're going to land sometimes in genes, knock out those genes. Sometimes they'll carry an extra gene with them, duplicate a gene. So it's a quick way to produce a, a great deal of variation in a plant if you remove the epigenetic regulation. And epigenetics in a given plant is likely species, genotype, and contact specific. So if in your species of interest, if you've got it all figured out and you move over a little bit to a new species, probably something that has to be relearned. I want to stress epi alleles are heritable and can be stable through generations. Plants, animals, any eukaryotic system. And I have this slide as sort of a continuum of awareness about epigenetic impacts on plant phenotype. So think about, um, I was talking about Jim, a, a forage agronomist and grassland ecologist, he's aware of it and, you know, exposed to it, but the layperson maybe never has seen the word epigenetics. Everybody's heard of genetics, but epigenetics, not, not so many people. And then there's now, an, you know, the popularization of epigenetics now is, is like through a diet called the epigenetics diet that's supposed to alter your epigenome and so I can't think of a diet phase fad that isn't you know rife with inaccuracy so the popularization of this is um, likely to be impacted by that if you're a restoration ecologist you're aware that whatever seed source you use should be locally adapted and may or may not be aware of epigenetic impacts on phenotype and you get over here to like plant, plant breeder and geneticist you know if you've got a a degree in plant breeding or genetics, you're aware of epigenetics and what that is, unless you graduated in 1995 when it didn't exist and you've been kind of in the, in the dark for a while. If you've been going to conferences, you, you're aware of it. And so plant breeder and geneticists will use multiple locations and years to offset epigenetic impacts on field trials. So multiple years, multiple locations, you deal with some of that variation. And then epi breeder and epigenetist at the far extreme creates epi alleles, tries to manipulate epigenetics, and then characterizes established epigenetic differences between phenotypes. And the really hardcore epigenetics, epigeneticists are exploring the mechanisms of epigenetics. How does, how does this work? How do these protein machines work together to do all these things? I should point out that anybody who grows plants and collects seeds also creates epi alleles. If you're growing up plants and then you collect those seeds and you know, grow them somewhere, you've, you've created <coughs> epi alleles that are specific to that site <coughs> and the environment in which you grew them. So you may be an epi breeder and didn't even know it. And I think we're getting close to the end, so with that I'll end it. I appreciate it. Very good. Uh, we have time for questions. Yes, sir. It's Lynn. Yeah. Can you separate epigenetics from G by E? So, 
you could you could even think of it as g by e by e. So yeah, yeah, you you sh you can separate that. But most people talk about g by e. You're talking about environment. We're just not there yet. I am not a mammalian geneticist, and so this, that, that example is kind of outside of my expertise. So I'm not sure I can answer that in a satisfying way for you. And then plants don't really have those type of freak out behaviors. <laughs> I'd like to, to ask another round, um, a round of applause for, for Jeff. We need to move forward. He's, he's going to be around. All right, next, next speaker, uh, 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 well, Dr. Bridget Lynch. Uh, we represent the, the, the Ireland group, uh, and uh, she's a senior uh, scientist at, at Chagas, uh, and uh, she's gonna speak about legumes as a biological tool to address the sustainability of ruminant production systems. Bridget. Thank you very much, and I'm going to present this paper on behalf of um, myself and Associate Professor Helen Sheridan, um, who couldn't make um, the conference, um, unfortunately. I'm okay. <laughs> I'll use the clicker. Um, so the farm to fork strategy is part of the European Green Deal and it has set out to improve the sustainability of our food um, systems in the European Union. There are some ambitious targets as part of this strategy. Um, so the reduction in um, nutrient uh, pollution in our waterways, our losses of nutrients, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus, um, a 20% reduction um, in fertilizer usage, chemical fertilizer usage, um, and also a target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and fisheries um, by at least 50%. If we look at the percentage of permanent grassland um, per EU country, which is shown here, um, the dark bars represent the percentage permanent grassland per utilizable uh, or per utilizable agricultural area, and the lighter bars represent um, permanent grassland as a percentage of total land use. You can see um, by far and above, Ireland has the largest percentage of permanent grassland per utilizable agricultural area. And air grasslands are temperate grasslands. We don't get extreme dry or wet seasons or cold seasons. Um, they are rotationally grazed and the intensity of that rotational grazing, um, there's, a, there's variability in that. But um, largely our dairy systems are intensive um, and then there's probably a spread in the intensity in our dry stock systems. So from an Irish point of view, agriculture is the lar largest contributor um, to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we have set out a target to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions um, in Ireland by 2030 by 25%. Um, with the aim of reaching um, climate neutrality by 2050. We have marginal abatement cost curve analysis, which looks at technologies that we can deploy on farm level and the cost of those technologies. Um, and the aim is to stack those technologies cumulatively on farm level in order to reduce um, our greenhouse gas emissions. One of the key strategy is the deployment um, and establishment of clover on farms. And in Ireland, white clover is by far our most common legume that we use um, in grasslands in Ireland, um, and it does very well when it's established. 
Also, I guess the, we have a target to restore all water bodies to good status by 2027. Currently, that's at 50%. So we are currently, um, I suppose, facing possible reductions in our permissible organic stocking rates and the amount of chemical fertilizer that we can apply um, to our grasslands um, and through our ruminant um, production systems. This is a summary of white clover incorporation um, in a dairy grazing trial um, that my colleagues in Moorpark conducted over an eight year period um, where they compared grass only swards receiving 250 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year to a grass white clover um, system um, uh, receiving 150 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year. The difference between the two systems um, over uh, at the eight year period uh, is shown in the final column. Um, so you can see that the herbage, average herbage production didn't differ between the two systems, despite the white clover um, system receiving 100 kilos of nitrogen less um, per annum. The silage fed during the lactation, there was an additional 74 kilos fed during the lactation to the white clover treatment, and most of that was fed in the autumn period. The average clover content was 22% um, across the eight year period. We saw an increase in milk yield and milk solids um, in the white clover treatment compared to the grass only. And this increased um, nitrogen use efficiency and increased net profit per hectare by 108 euro per cow per year. And that was driven by a reduction um, in chemical fertilizer usage and by an increase in, in, milk, in milk solids production and milk yield production. So um, we aim to have an, an average annual um, percentage of clover in the sward of 20%, um, but that ranges throughout the year. Um, so it starts between zero and 5%. In February, increases to a peak of between 30 and 50% um, in September, and then it decreases there afterwards. We have a seasonal spring calving dairy system in Ireland. Um, so our cows, the majority of them calve down in February. So we have a high demand for a grass um, in the spring period of the year. Um, so I suppose, um, you know, the clover is, is, is um, not at its highest content at that period of time. So there can be a herbage availability challenge and a challenge with regards to adoption of white clover on farm levels because of that. Um, there's also studies underway um, incorporating white clover into sheep systems. This um, table summarises um, three years of work um, that my colleague Philip Crichton has conducted in Chagas and Athen Rye, where he compared grass only to grass um, clover at a high nitrogen um, and grass clover at a low nitrogen. And you can see again that there were benefits with regards to down performance, where average daily gain was increased um, under the clover incorporated. Um, swords and there was a reduced days to slaughter. With regards to herbage production, there was no differences across those treatments, um, despite the low nitrogen um, treatment getting um, 45 kilos of nitrogen less um, per hectare per year. The red clover incorporation into grassland systems, um, there's a number of, I suppose, projects and studies that have begun. Um, we've got one publication, um, a recent publication, red clover incorporation into grasslands in Ireland um, uh, recently. This is work that Conor Hulhan did um, as part of his PhD, where he looked at red clover incorporation into different grass species um, and looked at different um, pre-grazing herbage masses. This was a cut study um, with um, small plots and we saw that there was an increase in herbage production when you included red clover in the sward um, we did increase in crude protein content which you would expect um, in a clover based sward but we did see that there was a reduction in organic matter digestibility um, of those swards compared to the grass only ones so what happens if we diversify the sward a little bit more beyond grass only or beyond grass white clover or beyond grass red clover only. Um, and 
we can see here there's a number of alternative plant species and these plant species is where the work um, has been focused in Ireland. Um, there are other plant species that we have looked at, um, I guess in plot work and grazing work, but these are the main plant species that establish um, to reasonable um, uh, amounts in this ward and that do persist under intensive grazing systems. Um, so. I guess over 10 years ago, we embarked on studying how, if we uh, included all of those pasture species in the swards, um, what would the impact on, would those be on herbage production? And the literature would suggest that we would get an increase in herbage production at lower nitrogen levels, but we were also interested in the feeding value of those swards, the persistency of those swards when they're incorporated into uh, an intensive rotational grazing system and what would the animal performance be. So some of the initial work that we done on, on this, um, we started with a sheep grazing study. We found that we got an increase in weaning weights, reduced days to slaughter, and reduced antimintic usage when um, we compared um, the multi-species swords, or that six species mix um, compared to grass only. Um, we found that we um, produce similar levels of herbage production compared to the grass only sward um, with 70 kilos less of chemical nitrogen. However, when we grazed them um, with sheep or when we grazed them with beef animals in a plot-based study, um, we found that the persistency of those swards started to decrease significantly and after two years, um, both the legume proportion, but particularly the herb proportion of the sward, um, the plantain and chicory. Also, I suppose, to look at the application of these in a, in Darien, um, a meta-analysis was completed by Kate McCarthy, where she looked at the herb inclusion compared to grass only and compared to grass clover swords. And she found that there wasn't a reduction in urinary nitrogen excretion when herb was included um, in the studies that she reviewed in the literature and compared to grass only and grass clover, but there was an increase in milk yield when herbs were included in the sward. Um, also, I suppose we looked at um, and found that when herbs and plantain in particular were included in the sward, that there was a mitigation potential there to reduce nitrous oxide emissions and nitrate leaching in legume um, containing swards, which follows on from the session um, if you sat in on it on plantain um, yesterday afternoon. So to follow on from that initial body of work that was completed, um, uh, the UCD Lions long-term grazing platform was established in 2019, um, where we established three farmlets or three um, grassland treatments. So perennial ryegrass only receiving 205 kilos of chemical nitrogen per hectare per year, a grass white clover um, receiving 90 kilos um, of chemical nitrogen per hectare per year, and then a six species mix. So the Prenny ryegrass, timothy, white clover, red clover, a plantain, and chicory. In this um, mix that we sowed um, in the UCD long-term grazing platform, we increased the inclusion levels of white clover, red clover, plantain, and chicory compared to the initial studies that we did. And we also sowed grazing tolerant um, cultivars of those species in order to try and increase the persistency of those swords. These were evaluated or grazed um, with dairy calf to beef animals. Um, obviously, because of our dairy industry, we've got a lot of dairy calves um, in the country um, that need to be finished. And our target pre-grazing herbage mass was 1,500 kilos of dry matter per hectare above the post-grazing um, um, residual. So we deal in the grazing horizon with regards to target pre-grazing herbage masses. And that post-grazing sward height um, for the grass and grass clover treatment was four centimetres, and it was six centimetres for the multi-species sward. Again, following that initial body of work to try and improve the persistency in the sward, and also um, uh, a residual study um, conducted in Chagas Grange by Peter Doyle um, showed that there was no difference um, between four and six centimetres um, when beef animals are, are grazing swords. So this shows um, the annual yield um, for the first two years of the study. Um, 
So you can see that there was no difference between the perennial ryegrass and the white clover treatment, but the multi-species swards um, produced more annual herbage over that two-year period uh, compared to the perennial ryegrass and the perennial ryegrass white clover treatment. So what was contributing um, to those swards with regards to um, yield? So this shows the contribution of functional group. So looking at the grass fraction compared to the legume fraction compared to the herb fraction. Um, so in the multi-species swards, the, you can see the grass sorry, is represented by green. Um, the clover um, proportion is yellow and the herb proportion is blue. And then we've also got the weed and dead material represented. Um, so you can see that there was a larger proportion of clover clover material in the multi-species treatment um, compared to the grass white clover um, and we had a good um, uh, contribution of the herbs um, to the sward um, and to yield in the multi-species trial. So if we separate them out by season um, and look at the sown species contribution um, for the multi-species only, um, we've got uh, the early season here, which is the March to May period. We've got mid-season in the middle, which is June to August, and then the late season is September to November. Um, so the green represents the grasses, so perennial ryegrass, timothy, yellow is white clover, red is red clover, um, blue is plantain, and the purple is the chicory. Um, so you can see that um, the clover increased, particularly the red clover increased as the year progressed at the expense of the grass um, fraction of the sward and also um, at the expense of the herb fraction of the sward as the year progressed. Um, so that's no real surprise, I guess, with regards to clovers. Um, and we did see that the plantain proportion of the sward um, was higher at the start of the year compared to the mid and the late season and that shows that it's winter active um, and perhaps uh, can contribute to herbage production in legume containing or clover containing swards in Ireland. So I suppose there's no point um, producing um, additional tons of herbage um, if they have inferior nutritive value. So we're interested to see what the nutritive value of these swords were. Um, so regard and the red represents perennial ryegrass. The yellow is the perennial ryegrass and white clover, and the multi-species is the green in these graphs. So we saw a reduction in, in NDF um, in the clover and the multi-species compared to the grass fraction. Uh, we had a significant increase in ADL um, in the multi-species, um, numerically, I suppose, fall or maybe biologically um, not that significant. With regards to crew protein, as you would expect, the legume containing swords increase crew protein. Um, uh, we saw an increase in ash content in the multi-species compared to the grass-only swards, and we're seeing that repeatedly um, where you have herbs inside in the sward that they increase more um, nutrients and minerals, um, and that <coughs> follows through in a higher ash content when you analyse the herbage. A reduction in water-soluble carbohydrates um, and also a reduction in dry matter concentration in the legume-containing swards and then also in the herb-containing swards. Um, and that would be expected because there's lower dry matter in um, the herbs and the legumes. Um, this is a study that Kieran Hearn um, conducted and published this year where he looked at separating out um, do, those species um, and evaluating them in a small plot study that was grazed by dairy cows. So he evaluated grass only as the control and compared it to grass plus the individual herbs, grass plus the individual um, white clovers, then grass plus the two clovers together um, and grass plus um, the uh, clover and the herbs um, all together. So quite a busy table, so I'm just going to uh, point out the important points. So we have botanical composition and chemical composition. Um, so you can see that the white clover and plantain um, established um, to good quantities in this um, experiment. And overall, um, compared to the red clover and the uh, chicory um, um, proportions in the sward, and overall we found that the grass and the white clover with the plantain provided a good stable um, uh, sward with regards to the um, pasture species and stability of what was in the sward um, and uh, uh, I suppose a, a good um, chemical composition or nutritive value. 
This um, is a summary table. There is a lot of grazing trials underway in Ireland um, on multi-species. This compares the multi-species compared to grass-only swords um, in sheep production systems, beef production systems, and also in dairy systems. Overall, we see that there are benefits in the dry stock systems with regards to sheep and beef production systems with regards um, increased average daily gain and reduced days to slaughter. Um, in the dairy systems, a bit, it's a bit more mixed, um, the results so far. Um, so we would have seen some increases in milk yield and some no differences um, in the multi-species trials so far. So I suppose in summary, what do we know? Um, we know that we can produce similar or increase um, levels of forage, reduce chemical inputs. We're getting more information with regards to the nutritive value of multi-species swords compared to grass and grass clover. We're seeing um, animal health and performance benefits, but again, quite mixed um, responses, um, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, drought tolerance, weed suppression, um, and also um, legacy effects for following on crops after multi-species. Um, there's still a lot of challenges when you diverse the sward beyond grass or beyond grass white clover. It's quite a dynamic sward, um, so no sward tends to be the same. You get variability in the inclusion levels of the species in the swards, um, and therefore it gets quite difficult to predict um, when farmers sow out multi-species swards, what um, species are going to be there in, in significant amounts in order to drive herbage production and animal production. Optimising seed mixes and inclusion levels. Um, another challenge um, is unknown varieties. So we have a national recommended list for grass and for white clover, but we don't for red clover, plantain and chicory and timothy. So sometimes you can see, um, uh, uh, I suppose, seeds being sold at farm level that don't have varieties that are going to persist well in grazing systems. So grazing tolerant varieties are, are, are really important. And I suppose at the minute our control is going to be perennial ryegrass and white clover and everything needs to be evaluated against that um, from now on in order to quantify what the advantage is compared to grass and white clover. Um, and that's it from me. I'd like to thank my collaborators, but most importantly, the PhD students that do all the work <laughs> on behalf of the PIs who get to present it at conferences. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bridget. I uh, may have time for one question while I upload the other presentation. Any question? Yeah, please. Can you tell us a little bit more about the challenge that you're facing when establishing those mixed boards and some of the steps that you're putting your teeth in the process and also early, uh, or things that will come earlier than others? Yeah, so. I guess something I didn't mention is that we have no herbicides that we can use for herb containing swords in Ireland. Um, we have no chemistry that we're allowed to use. So when we're establishing these swords, getting a, a, a sterile seabed is really important um, in order to make sure that we don't have a lot of weeds that come in this ward afterwards. Um, but when they're established from a full reseed or regrassing, they establish quite well. Um, uh, and we find that chicory comes very strongly in the sward initially and then starts to decrease over time. Um, um, but they establish pretty good in the first year, but chicory tends to be dominant. Yeah. Our next speaker, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Bob. Bob Body. <laughs> Bob is a senior research uh, from Embrapa Agrobiology in Brazil. He's going to talk about stoloniferous forage legumes for sustainable mixed pastures in the tropics. Bob? Okay. Good afternoon. Pleasure to be here. Uh, even it is so cold. <laughs> right. Um, this is work of a team we call the Pegasus Group. Um, and uh, it's the people from the, my institution, Embrapa Agrobiology, the university across the road, which is the rural university of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, there's the CEPLAC, the Cocoa Research Pastures Division. Uh, very important contribution from the University of Lavras with Bruno and Danielle. And uh, this is the people from our place. Okay. Um, 
there we go. So, Brazil has over 50 million hectares of brachiaria pastures. That's just brachiaria. So it's a lot, a great deal. And most of it looks like this, degraded. So, how do we go from this to this? Well, obviously the thing is uh, fertilizer, right? Uh, with improved management, with nitrogen fertilization, this is taking the whole herd, we can improve uh, output of uh, carcass from up to 50% by um, per, per hectare, okay? Or per herd, sorry, per herd. But uh, the really big gain is, uh, you don't get such a big gain as you'd expect because you've got the whole herd, okay, which you, you're putting in to the, the, the nitrogen fertilizer, et cetera. But when the, the, the cattle fatten up more quickly, but the really big gain comes from the reduction in the area that you need. On a degraded pass, you need 30 hectares for these 200 animals or so, right? When you have uh, oh, a low input, that's just without nitrogen fertilizer, just reviewing the thing, you can get down to 13. And with good end fertilization, you can get down to five hectares. So you really are sparing five sixths of your land can go back to forest if you like, okay? No, it won't, but anyway. So, the simulation studies that we did, and other people have done very similar work, the, when you look at the uh, methane, em uh, the greenhouse gas emissions, for this is all the em emissions, en no nitrous oxide, even the fossil CO2, et cetera, as you put in more and more inputs, you're putting in, you're getting more and more gases, greenhouse gases. But if you take this as a factor of the quantity of carcass, you're looking at emission intensity, you find there's the f that you can decrease per kilo of product, okay? So your emission intensity goes down. Now, that's with nitrogen fertilizer. What would happen if we had a legume? Well, what we'd expect would be something like this, that we would get higher emissions, yes, we get more nitrous oxide, but we wouldn't have to pay for the nitrogen fertilizer with CO2, okay, fossil CO2. So the expected emissions would go up, but the expected emission per carcass would expect to go down. So how can we do that? Well, what is the potential of the forage legumes? Compared to pastures without any fertilizer, of course, you get a higher production with a lower emission of greenhouse gases per kilogram of carcass, okay? And compared to pastures with N-fertilized addition, you also dispense with the avoided, you get rid of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with the manufacture, transport, and application of the nitrogen fertilizer. But the questions we wanted to answer, and our research has been answering in these last few years, how will the legume residues affect nitrous oxide emissions compared with N-fertilizer? And will the presence of the legume in the diet lower N, uh, enteric methane emissions? But all of this is not very interesting unless we've got persistence of the legume in the pasture. Now, if you ask the majority of Brazilians, even my age or a bit younger, they will tell you that, oh, it's no use, the legumes don't stay in the pastures, it's a waste of time. And we've found that working with people in our group in Bahia and with Lavras, that this is not true altogether. The forage legumes they mainly looked at were Stylosanthi species. And they form seeds at the top of the stalk. And most of them are consumed by the animal, or even if they fall to the ground, they don't germinate. They're very hard seeds, okay? So that's really why, after a year or two, you lose all your style samples. I keep on clicking it. Right. But stoloniferous legumes, there's two main ones that we've worked with. This is Arachis pintoi, the forage peanut, or Desmodium arvalifolium, which is, keep on changing the name. It's now grown a heterocarpa subspecies of arvalifolium. But what happens is that the, um, the brachiaria is tall, and if you don't keep the brachiaria down, the legume has to grow up. Can you see this plant here? There's a rachis pintoi going up here. There's no way that any stolon is going to get to the ground and reproduce and continue its pr vegetative propagation. So the solution is, we say the secret because nobody seems to realize that you can do this with legumes in Brazil, is that the solution is to maintain pasture height 
at around 20 to 30 centimetres maximum. And this comes from the work at Lavras. They showed they got through to the same figure that the people in Bavaria had been getting using a light inception work, light interception work. And 90 to 95% light interception is the same thing. And in that case, your pastures can go. And this is, this is with uh, the forage peanut. Nine years, so nine years, I'm just saying nine years because I mean persistent pasture. This is a persistent uh, um, weight gain of animals, right? Uh, increase with time, it seems. And this is over the whole time, compared to 120 kilos of nitrogen fertilizer on, on Brachiaria brisantha. The Brachiaria brisantha in, with the uh, forage, forage peanut uh, produce more, okay? So it, it can rival that. And this is the other legume is Desmodium of ovaliforum. We had a rather dry period here. It didn't work quite so well, but still the, the, the legume <coughs> managed to compete well with the fertilizer. And after um, five years, this is the two years of the five years, the last, last two years of the five years, you can see that it competed with 150 kilos of nitrogen fertilizer. A 60% a increase over no nitrogen at all. The same if you use the mixed pasture or if you used 150 kilos of N. This is per hectare. This is per animal. Okay. And in the legume, some people asked me, so I put it in this thing. The legume in the diet was around 18%, but on the field it was around over 30. They, they do select rather against the legume. It's rather bitter. It's a lot of tannins, which might be useful for the methane, right? So what we looked at was the uh, N2O emissions. Um, what they did was put a, um, a cage in the field where you put these uh, uh, or chambers for measuring nitrous oxide and well they also looked at the ammonia volatilization I haven't got the data for that here and you put a, a pancake of cow dung or a litre of urine inside your chamber and then you just cover this up for an hour and measure the emissions and a lot of hard work and I haven't got all the names of the students here that have done it but anyway and this is what we looked at we found that uh, always the urine um, was a higher emitter than the dung and in fact it was about five times higher than the dung as an emission factor. The emission factor was 0 0.4 which for um, cattle excreta is low. It's recommended to be about 2%. So this is, for, this is the area, this is roughly what we find in most parts of Brazil on the oxisols or in the, the tropical regions. The drain, the evaporation is quick, the drainage is quick. There's not much time for denitrification and nitrous oxide production. <coughs> right, this is the total of all of the emissions from nitrous oxide, counting the litter, the plant residues, but it also, this is also includes whatever underneath in the soil. Then we've got the, the N applied as nitrogen fertilizer has an N2O emission. The nitrogen deposit as dung has an N2O emission and the nitrogen deposit as urine has an N2O emission. Adding it all up, you can see that you've got another 500 or so uh, grams of carbon dioxide, of nitrous oxide, uh, N2O-N per hectare per year with the fertilizer compared with the, um, the, uh, fertili the, the, the mixed pasture, okay? So, and then we've looked at uh, methane. Well, this is on the Arrakis Pintoi pastures at Lavras. And we've got a lot of work going on at the moment. It's the first experiment, really, that we've come up with. And this is uh, showing a small reduction in the methane production per animal per day. But when you put it on per hectare, you find it's much larger, very considerably less than 150 kilos of nitrogen. Um, the legume diet was 29% in this case. Arrakis pintoi, the uh, forage peanut, is much more palatable. The animals like it a lot, but it's lower in tannins. That's why it's more palatable. So its effect on methane perhaps isn't as radical as perhaps desmodium might be. We're doing that now. We'll, I'll let you know next year. Anyway. And this is when you look at all of the emissions, right? The enteric methane, the nitri nitrous oxide from excreta, and the N2O from fertilizer. And this is when you look at the emission intensity with the kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of carcass. So it's win, 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 okay? <laughs> so results from the experiments at Lavras show that the GHG emission intensity is 35% lower for the mixed forage legume peanut pasture 
than the, Euro the Brachiaripasha alone, with 150 kilos, okay? After three to four years, there's considerable nitrogen transfer from the legume to the grass, which we believe is through the litter, mainly. And with this legume, or Desmodium ovalifolium, animal performance increases with time on these pastures compared to the infertilized pastures. So that you're getting higher yields with time because the legume is transferring considerable amount of nitrogen to the grass. And the animals like the grass more than they like to eat the legume, especially with the case of Desmodium. With these legumes in a mixed pasture with uh, Brachia brisantha, Eurocloa brisantha, Animal weight gain can be the same than or more than grass alone pastures are mended with 150 kilos of nitrogen. So we can economize 150 kilos of nitrogen, get lower emissions all at the same time. So summarizing up the big advantages, which I'm just flashing in front of your eyes, is that we dispense with all emissions from end fertilizer. It has lower enteric methane emissions, has lower nitrous oxide emissions, and after two to three years, the cost for the farmer is lower than for end fertilizer. So he doesn't have to pay. All the other methods of reducing methane, you have to give them NOI, uh, that NOI th three, was it? Uh, NOP three, or one of those chemicals, and somebody's gotta pay for that. In this case, the, the, it comes for free. There is such a thing as a free lunch. It's a stoloniferous legume, okay? And, of course, I have to mention it. There's always some problems. At the moment, this is Arrakis pinto, especially the forage uh, peanut, has been used extensively in Acre in the Amazon biome, over a million hectares of it. It's working beautifully. It also works beautifully in the Atlantic forest area, but won't work in the Sahado area because of the very long dry season, five months without rain, four months without rain. And even the Desmodium, we don't think will work very well in that area. So we need more research to select a legume, stoloniferous legume preferably, for this region of the Sahada, the, the very large area, uh, the Sahada uh, of all of the Sahada is 200 million hectares, but about half of it's pasture. And uh, you know, that was really important that we get a legume for that biome. For that biome. Uh, and seeds. At the moment, Desmodium or volume seeds are being produced in Brazil, but the seed companies are waiting for the demand to increase and the demand won't increase until they see the application, so it's a bit like the chicken and the egg syndrome. You know, until we get the demand, we won't want to produce the seeds. Until we've got the seeds, we can't show you how good it is for to, to produce the demand. So, but the forage peanuts, they're basically mainly very poor seed producers, and they're underground and difficult to harvest and expensive. But there is a company now, started up, which is producing what they call sprigs, of te I'm told, uh, for, uh, I can't call them seedlings, they don't come from seed, but they're, they're made from stem pieces. And they're planting these in the field at about 10,000 per hectare. And uh, they say it's, they're getting take up. They're getting take up. They're getting people to bring this in. And so this is the way that we could go forward at least for some time until somebody comes up with a better seeding version or some more legumes which produce the seeds. So, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Bob. Uh, we have time for questions. And uh, I have uh, good and bad news. Uh, the bad news is Dr. Uh, Nohun Zampaligri. He was not able to make uh, the trip to come here. So we're not going to have our next speaker. But the good news is that you're going to have more time to make questions, not only for Bob, but also for the other speakers. Uh, so let's, uh, let's enjoy the time, the extra time, and, and make more, you know, some questions. So Bob, we've got plenty of time. <laughs> Any questions? Jim. Historically, we've, we've found it 
Yeah, um, yeah I, I think I have some information that's really we I worked on stylosanthes for a time and uh, I've got a picture of one of my students with stylosanthes up here in the just after the end of the wet season you know just they started to dry it and the animals won't touch it most this one this is this is mineral a variety called mineral and uh, the animals wouldn't touch it during the rainy in the rainy season when all the grass was all green when the grass all dried out, in this is in the Sahara region, all dried out, they went onto the, the stylosanthes and maintained their weight, which normally is a weight loss at that time of year in, the, in low input systems. So uh, they were using, there's a paper just out on pigeon pea, which they found the same thing, and they're showing lower, lower methane emissions during the, that period. This is with uh, the people from uh, Alessandri Bernci, probably one of him, his group down there. Um, so, yeah, the, the palatability, in this case, these palatitis is on the, on the merge. They will eat some of it, even when, you know, there's rain all the year round. Um, but uh, with the Iraqi spinto, there's not much problem. They'll eat it. And the, the tannins are low, but not so low that they don't inhibit methane. So uh, it's, yeah, it's very important. But uh, what we really need now is a, is a survey of legumes that would, would go for the, the Sahara region. We've got pigeon pea, that'll work. But, uh, and we've got stylothanses that will go for a year or so. And with the integrated crop livestock systems which are going in, we only go for pasture for a year and then you go back to cropping. We don't need this, uh, this uh, sustainability of persistence. So, so you're saying that persistence isn't necessarily related to palatability, it's also related to uh, reproduction strategies as well? well in this case, yes, the, the, the two legumes are a little different in that the desmodium is more uh, higher in, it's higher in uh, unpalatable tannins, but they both manage the same way and it's the vegetative reproduction which is the secret to keep them going. Question there? How do you establish the transplants? Can you repeat the question? How do you establish the plant? Well, they're in the... Oh, I can't go back. The picture that I showed you, you saw this, that they're, they're in little, they're just like, I think it's just rather like the Tifton production, the small pockets with a, a growth soil, rich soil medium, and they just put little stem pieces in. You have to have a node, must at least one or two nodes on each stem piece, and you put them in there. Uh, keep it watered, and I don't know how many months, two, two three months you've got. So then how do you put them in the field? Uh, in the field, they've got a planting machine which, uh, you know, comes on a conveyor belt and puts them in, and a guy walks behind covering it up. It's usually just kind of mechanized, not fully mechanized. The tractor goes in front, small tractor, with pushing this with two rows, and the guy comes in behind checking it out. That's what I've seen. But uh, I, don't, I haven't been into the field to see this yet. They've been doing it behind my back. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> oh, yeah, Magnum. You run a research program to answer those questions because uh, I'm afraid <laughs> we've, we've, our work has done, uh, the work at, uh, in Rio de Janeiro we centered there because we've got all the instruments to measure the, the nitrous oxide, methane, SF6, and ma we even do the mass spectrometry for carbon 13 and, and 15 and stuff. So we've got our field station, so to speak, which is in the south of Bahia, which is a humid all year round. We've got plots over the road at the uni Federal University and at Lavras. But we haven't worked at all in that region. I would assume that those legumes that we have would not be successful there because it would be the same problem as the Sahara. They're not going to go through a four or five month dry season. And in the arid northeast, it's a longer dry season and less rainfall when it comes. Liana. Yeah. I don't know if the birds also saw that, but they're just native, or they just, they, they disappear. You have to have a good IPCC 
Yeah, yeah, I, I, exactly him who I'm going to, I'm talking with him. Oh, and his okay. interest is to get legumes which he can plant in very, very poor soils to recover the soil to put in crops. But it's not quite the same no, uh, he target. He's got about at least 80 legumes he's collected. He's a marvelous he man. He did a collection. He yeah. has a collection yeah. of the small ones. Sure. I know. Which yeah. he really doesn't know what to we do. We need to talk with him more. <laughs> but I think about questions about the semi I forgot that we've got a guy from Pernambuco here. He must <laughs> and one we haven't mentioned, which of course is tree legumes, which you've also worked with. Oh, so okay. and so I think <laughs> we'll probably get, some, probably get some of that just now. Any other questions? You still have 15 minutes. Um, I do have, oh, Jim, go ahead. I have a question for Great. Jeff. Yes. <laughs> yes. The forecast is for climate to to be more more radical in its extremes, as well as uh, the rate of change. Um, and so, my question is how how will the relative importance of epigenetics versus genetics uh, change with these extremes or with, with the speed up of human induced um, climate changes? So more extreme uh, weather would mean, would mean more extreme epigenetic marks on the genome. Um, what do you do about that practically? So the forage breeder, not forage, but the legume breeder I talked to is a peanut breeder. And I asked him, do you even consider you know, epigenetics when you're breeding? And he's saying, I've got a lot of stuff I'm tracking. I've got hundreds of lines. and." 20, 30,000 genes in each of four, you know, genomes in this allo tetraploid, and layering epigenetic concerns on top of that is not even a concern of his. He's like, I'm, I'm making progress. This is, you know, epigenetics is a, you know, another thing I don't need to deal with. But will, will there be more extreme impacts? Absolutely. I have, have a question uh, to Dr. Bridget Lynch. Uh, I want you to comment on the adoption uh, by producers of uh, the multiple species swords in Ireland. Yeah, so I suppose the multi-species swords, uh, for some reason, farmers have engaged in them re really well and they have adopted them quite readily, probably ahead of we've been able to develop a blueprint for them um, with regards to their management. In addition, the Department of Agriculture has incentivized their adoption on farm levels um, by offering, um, I, I suppose, money um, per hectare of multi-species swords and grass red clover that's sown on swords. So they're definitely putting, um, I suppose, backing behind them um, as a mitigation strategy to reduce um, nitrogen. But Farmers are curious about them and they're sowing them. Um, and uh, I suppose we just need to try and keep up with that with regards to research. <laughs> Thanks, Bridget. More questions? We still have time. So it's a, it's a question for Bob. Um, what do you think we are missing, Bob, um, being all these years talking about the benefits of legumes in several different locations? You can go to Australia, to Florida, to Brazil, mainly warm season legumes. And we can see that they have uh, adoption of the cool season. You ask somebody to oversee ryegrass and crimson clover every year, and they are comfortable with. But then they look at the warm season, and they think it needs to be perennial. And they are reluctant to replant. And if a two year is a failure, right? If a legume dies after two years, and what are we missing that we cannot convince our clientele or producers that are the end users of the technology to adopt this? Yeah, well, I would say there's, there's kind of two groups of producers here. If we're talking about the extensive pasture management, uh, it's very low input. And the guy keeps going, probably if he's got a little bit of sense, he'll, he'll, he'll uh, 
restore his pasture every five to ten years. He plow it all up and, and put down lime, potassium and phosphorus. He probably won't put any nitrogen on, but he stimulates the mineralization so he gets a win on his, uh, mines the soil for a bit of nitrogen and he gets his brachiaria to keep going. Um, in his case, he, he, you know, he puts a leg in for a couple of years and he's got to go and plow up again or seed bed in. He doesn't need to do the whole plowing, he can put it in strips, but he's very reluctant to have to go and mess, you know. So uh, uh, our technology f with a stoloniferous leg in which will go for years is very attractive to him. The other producer is the, the guy who's more advanced and he's going for integrated crop livestock or integrated crop forestry livestock. You know, and in that case, uh, they want a legume that's productive, germinates quickly, gets in there. You can put it in after, if you're going for in, standard integrated crop livestock is soybean followed by maize on the sown with brachiaria and you have three or four months in the dry season to graze animals. And you really don't have much time to establish a legume at that time. But if you go for a two year period and you know, he can get his legume established, it's very interesting for even to use stylosanthes and they've got new variety is the size of is coming out which produce more seeds and are very productive. So they, they will fit into that system quite well, but uh, we're talking like something like 15 million hectares compared to 50 million hectares of the, the guys who are still on the you know, straightforward pasture management. More questions? Oh, it's back. So, Bob, I'd, I'd be curious as to your assessment of what do you consider the primary, the most important hurdle uh, or barrier to adoption of, of, of pintoy peanut in, in Brazil and in regions where it's ad adapted? Yeah, I, well, we're just off the blocks, really. It's only a, a year or so. Just under a year ago, I got some publicity, we got some publicity on the, the rural channel, you know, and it got poured in lots of emails and saying, where can I get the seeds? And I said, ah. <laughs> and you, you think, and then, and because that that's what happens, they come in and say where to get the seeds, they wait a year or so and say, ah, that doesn't, that's no good. So we really are trying to twist the arm of the seed producer to get the, the desmodium seeds out. And it may be that this idea of using, you know, sp sprigs, uh, People have got some money, you know, they're, they're willing to invest and they've got to have courage. They've got to, I mean, once it's there, you can keep it there. But if you, you just happen to have a bad time, you always, oh, it's going to rain next week. So you put in all your sprigs and then the rain doesn't come. I mean, you'd lose all that. That'd be, so it, there is a risk there. But I, I think it's the, the planting material and the, deva and the propaganda and extension that we need, you know. But uh, until we got the seeds that we can say, yeah, do it, here's the seeds, um, it's really kind of difficult to go forward. And I'm afraid it's not really my speciality about diffusion of technology. Yeah, we need to break the chicken and egg uh, yeah, yeah. syndrome here, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> could, I, could I follow up and just ask, so in, with your sprigging technology, then I, I assume you're envisioning an, an, a grass legume context for that. Do you have some vision or the folks well, who are working? Doing, yeah. You can spray down strips you know, with, with Roundup and then plant your strips with the sprigs. Or you can renovate your whole pasture and put in like a new uh, sward. You, sometimes you might want the brachiaria seeds too, but there's a big seed bank in those soils normally. So you, you bring in the the new brachiaria and the sprigs at the same time and just plant the whole field. Does that answer your question? Thank you. More questions? Still have uh, five minutes more before we start the next. Miguel. So you have a technology that works, you know how to manage it. And so why are not the seeding companies interested in producing the seed? At least what happened in, 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 in Brazil. Uh, 
I think you, you have to understand that for years and years, people are saying, you know, legumes, forage legumes, ah, waste of time. No, won't work, won't work. A really big negative pressure between, you know, agronomists who work even for Imbrapa and people who work for the universities, and it's really negative pressure. And we've got to break that barrier. And then the, our propaganda that it works will get out and will be believed. I, I went on a field trip and I found a guy who'd got Desmodium for 20 years and his whole farm was Desmodium. It was fantastic, you know. So, it, it, but it, it's really difficult to, I don't know, perhaps you've got, you know, you've worked with all the work with Panicum, how these difficult it is to change mind on, on these things and get through to the farmers. One thing is that we just, just figure if you wanted it, you can get 300 kilos of uh, uh, Desmodium ovalium, Desmodium ovalifolium seeds per hectare, and you can plant three kilos per hectare. So you can multiply your area by 100 if you've got one year of uh, yield. So I mean, the seed company should be getting this out, right? But, uh, just a follow up on that question. Uh there are some regions uh, where we have uh, successful stories, uh, like in, in Acre, in northern Brazil, where they planted a lot. So what, what did they do different there that producers are adopting the technology? Do you know how to tell that story? They got Judson for him. Leona has some insights. Yeah, we, we always meet because of Unipasto, né, which is the association that uh, we're together with, with 31 seed producers. So Arakis, for instance, is inside the Unipasto program. So Unipasto, with the 31 producers, oh, not, not all, I mean, maybe one or two, but anyway, the association um, then tries to sell. We have one with seed now, so he wants to sell. They want to sell, so that's a good thing. But what they did in Acre that I know is that Jutsu, everywhere where there was the syndrome of the death of Brachiaria, he went out there with the sprigs and, we're <laughs> and made the farmers plant. So this was an effort of... Uh, uh, yeah, he's of Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's why. But also in Ipasto, um, we have Stylosantis, so that's why we sell solo Stylosantis seeds in Brazil. But the other genera, genera then we don't have uh, association of producers or interested producers. Yeah, but maybe, um, uh, maybe, no, even a uni, Unipasto can be interested in this modium and now with Zago's work and yours. And so you have to find producers that are interested and then will multiply and sell. So it, look, it looks like an extra effort of the, the outreach component would, would help, right? Like the case in, in, in Acre. For those that don't know, Unipass is a, um, a group of seed companies that got together uh, to fund um, breeding, uh, forage breeding programs in Brazil. Uh, and and they, they fund you know, programs in Embrapa and, and other institutions. Any other question, Jim? On Embrapa. On Embrapa, sorry. This is not a question, this is a contribution to this discussion, taking it away from, from Brazil and to other, to other parts. In Texas, uh, we're working with native legumes, and we have probably about 50 different species in north central Texas that we are interested in using, especially natural pastures. Seed companies will have nothing to do with it, understandably, because each one of these species has is unknown in terms of agronomy, uh, in terms of seed production, and in terms of market. Uh, the markets are very small, they're ecotypical, you know, for, for specific regions and specific soils. And so the ideal is to have mixed seeds, you know, multi-species seed mixtures for native pasture or rangeland reseeding, but that ideal is going to be very, very difficult to sell in terms of of economics uh, for the seed industry, both the producers as well as the distributors. 
Thanks, Jim. Um, all right, let's let's move forward. It's it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Lin Solenberger. I guess he doesn't need much introduction. <laughs> Dr. Solenberg is well known in the uh, area. He's a distinguished professor at the Agronomy Department at University of Florida, and he's going to talk about climate change and uh, legume performance in grassland agroecosystems. Thank you very much, Jose. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Bob, I think you should hold out for reimbursement on your flight home because uh, you, you kind of doubled your effort here with this extra 15 minutes. So to begin, I would like to uh, recognize uh, my co-author, Mark Coleman, from uh, University of Wisconsin. So to start, I think we can say that if legumes are going to mitigate the effects of climate change, they have to persist and they have to thrive in what I think we consider to be an, an inevitably changing climate going forward. With that in mind then, we need to understand how climate change factors are going to affect a range of forage legume responses. So, with that in mind then, our objectives are quite simple, uh, to review and synthesize literature addressing the effect of climate change factors on forage legume responses. So we're going to look at three primary climate change factors, atmospheric CO2, air temperature, and soil moisture. We'll consider both uh, temperate uh, climate legumes and warm climate legumes, both growing in mixture and monoculture. Uh, people are typically interested if you do a synthesis, you know, what did you go, how did you go about that process? So we used a generic search stream of, of climate change in forage legumes, and then we added a number of legume responses to that search stream, and those responses are, are shown uh, on the slide, and that actually then forms the outline for our talk today. So we're going to begin by looking at physiological responses of legumes to climate change factors. And I'm going to begin by talking about photosynthetic acclimation. So it turns out that C3 plants, upon initial exposure to elevated CO2, and you'll see eCO2 throughout the talk, and that means elevated CO2, but they don't always sustain that increase. There are a number of factors that have been associated with the lack of continued response uh, to elevated CO2 in terms of photosynthesis. There are stomatal factors in terms of uh, stomatal conductance, mesophyll conductance. There have also been some data showing decreases in the activity of uh, carbon-fixing enzymes. And then there are also carbon source and sink relationships, and we'll actually end up spending most of our time uh, referencing that particular issue. However, legumes typically do not acclimate to elevated CO2, and so then the question, logical question, is, is why? And it turns out that a significant amount of this is related to uh, nodules, nitrogen fixation, and their uh, carbon requirements. Baslam in 2014 looked at alfalfa as an example and under conditions of elevated CO2 found that photosynthesis rate increased. That then provided additional assimilate to roots which then in turn enhanced nodule development which again increased sink strength reconfirming, affirming that increased rate of photosynthesis. Legumes exposed to elevated CO2 also have been found to have greater leaf area and then altered metabolism and other aspects including photosynthetic rate, stomatal conductance, and water use efficiency. So looking then, we've moved in a transition away from acclimation now to stomatal properties. And Haberman et al. in 2019 looked at the tropical legume, Stylosanthes captata, we've been talking about stylos for a little bit, under conditions of elevated CO2 and temperature. 
they found that under conditions of elevated CO2, there was greater stomatal density and conductance, which reduced transpiration rates, actually resulted in increase in leaf temperature and an increase in soil moisture status, interestingly. Elevated CO2 also stimulated photosynthesis, as we've seen, starch concentration of plant tissues, water use efficiency, and some attributes of photosystem function. On the other hand, temperature, elevated T, T, ET as I'm calling it, smaller stomata, but no real effects on conductance, transpiration, or leaf water status. So their basic conclusion was that in terms of the effects of climate change factors on leaf and stomata properties, that CO2 is really the primary driver. Temperature has some effect on some traits in, turn, in terms of photosynthesis system two activity and antioxidants. So I'm gonna move from physiological aspects to uh, some terra firma that I'm more comfortable with, talking about forage accumulation and botanical composition. And so within this context, there are quite a few papers that have looked at elevated CO2, and they've done so then in combination with other climate change factors, and, and we'll look at some of those as we go along. Anybody faint yet? <laughs> I thought about the, that uh, panic reaction to stimulus of an epigenetic uh, <laughs> loci uh, whenever I show you this, this table. So what I'm going to do is very quickly orient you to the table, and then we'll go through it uh, piece by piece so you're not scarred but for life, okay? So if you look on the left side, you'll see the legume species that we're talking about, right? Simple enough. The next column shows you uh, what uh, the companion species is or if it's growing in monoculture. Third column, CO2 levels. We typically have an ambient level and an elevated level. The response, well, there's some other treatment factors, the, re the response, the result, and then uh, a citation. So we're gonna work our way through this. And the first thing I wanna really focus on is what is the effect of elevated CO2 on forage accumulation and legume proportion of the mixture. We're not gonna go through every one of these in detail, perhaps much to your relief, but if we start working our way down through white clover, you'll see very consistent responses. White clover growing under elevated CO2, we get increasing forage accumulation, increasing, if growing in mixture, we get increasing white clover contributions in the mixture. Moving on down, we've got subterranean clover, very similar kind of response, and then moving to a little warmer environment where we have rhizoma peanut, a subtropical member of the arrakis uh, genus. Elevated CO2 increases leaf, stem, root, and new rhizome mass. So that wasn't as painful as you thought, right? <laughs> right, right, okay, good. All right, now I'm gonna go back and pick up just a couple of other quick points. If you combine elevated CO2 with low nitrogen, interestingly what happens is that it drives down grass forage accumulation. And that's associated with the enhanced competitive ability of the legume and the inability of the legume to bring its own nitrogen lunch to the battle, right? Okay. Looking at white clover, when elevated CO2 occurred in conjunction with drought, a significant amount of that extra assimilate from elevated CO2 went below ground, interestingly. And then lastly on this table, if we look at uh, elevated temperature and CO2, we actually then drive down, that elevated temperature drives down the forage accumulation response from somewhere around, whoops, 19%. I'm not sure, okay, here we go. I pushed a little too hard on that one. Here we go. It drives down the response from an increase of 19% to about 8%. So high temperature is working in opposition to elevated CO2. All right, let's move on to nitrogen fixation. Been a number of studies looking at this. Um, elevated CO2 has fairly consistently increased nitrogen fixation, in this case, subclover. And 
Interestingly, the proportion of nitrogen from end fixation has also increased associated with elevated CO2, but it has declined in response to elevated temperature. Zanetti and Hartwig also looked at this, and they likewise found that elevated CO2 drove a higher percentage of clover end derived from nitrogen fixation from about 59 to about 66%. So then the question becomes, what does, or why does, elevated CO2 increase nitrogen fixation? Well, it turns out that greater nitrogen fixation is associated with greater number of nodules, which we already saw a little bit ago, but it's also a response to greater sink strength. As we increase CO2 in growth rates, nitrogen sink also increases accordingly. Zanetti and Hartwig, the reference we already made, they looked at mixtures and they found that growing legumes in mixtures actually increases the magnitude of that nitrogen sink. And so we expect to have higher nitrogen uh, fixation rates in, the, in that mixed context. So in general, when we can say that increased legume competitive ability with grass under elevated CO2 is associated with the legume's ability to fix N2 and to then overcome the reduced availability of soil N as higher yields are driving greater soil mineral N uptake. What about nutritive value? So it turns out that elevated CO2, the effects on nutritive value are somewhat less pronounced and considerably less pronounced than what we see in terms of forage accumulation. Most studies, however, do indicate greater non-structural carbohydrate concentration, but somewhat less N. The dreaded table. All right, so here we go again. Legume species, CO2 level, and what happened? And again, I'm not going to read all of these to you, but very quickly we can see nitrogen concentration decreasing, protein concentration decreasing with higher elevated, with, with elevated CO2, non-structural TNC, total non-structural carbohydrates, leaf non-structural carbohydrates increasing, okay? So that response seems relatively consistent. Just a couple other quick points. Warming actually decreased the total non-structural carbohydrate concentration and Newman et al. found virtually no effect of elevated CO2 on digestibility and fiber concentrations of uh, rhizoma peanut. Just a couple of other climate change factors and nutritive value. Drought, less pronounced than nutritive value, again, excuse me, less pronounced than forage accumulation. And one thing that was noted is that the effects of drought in terms of nutritive value are, tend to be all over the place. And it makes some sense because, you know, your drought to me may not, you know, it might be a good moisture situation to me. So uh, what is defined as a drought varies considerably in the literature. In general, I think we can say that the, the climate change factor that has the greatest impact on nutritive value is elevated temperature. A number of studies uh, point to this. And I would like to just show you that it depends on what part of the plant that you look at. Uh, this, these are some data from Joanna Newman. She looked at, at CO2, no effect, looking at p-values here, in terms of the effect of temperature going from ambient to ambient plus 4.5 C, no effect as well. If we looked at stem, however, the situation is the same down here, no effect, but we have linear decreases in digestibility and they are associated with linear increases in the fiber fraction, NDF, as well as lignin concentration. Lastly, then I want to look at some uh, more recent and very interesting uh, literature, at least it was to me, looking at legume flowering and pollination responses to climate change factors. There have been limited studies done on this topic, but Stylo, uh, Capitata has been a focus. So in this work, um, the first category of response we want to look at is uh, pollen grain morphology. 
And it turns out that climate change factors result in early de degeneration and hypertrophy of cells that are important for the nutrition and the development of pollen grains. They also affect the external cell wall and the pollen grain apertures. So we go to the bottom and get to the result, and the result of this is the decreased viability of pollen grains under uh, climate change conditions. What about flowering and pollination aspects? Similar treatments as the ones we just looked at, elevated temperature, elevated CO2, so let's see what happened. Elevated temperature increased flowering by about 70%. The combination of elevated CO2 and elevated temperature increased flower number by almost 140%. And together, they resulted in about an 83% increase in floral visits from pollinators. Interesting. Elevated temperature actually hastens the onset of floral opening in the morning, but it, they found that it did not affect the duration of floral opening throughout the day. And it also changes the timing of pollinator visits, which seem to be associated with nectar temperature. Under elevated temperatures, MALF 22, Nectar sugar concentration was 39% con uh, greater than under ambient. And this is just general plant aspects. Phillips, 2018, these plants, in this particular case, higher temperature and drought stress, flower earlier, produce fewer flowers. They begin flowers with flowering without producing nectar. And actually, they only allocate nectar to some proportion of flowers as a means of uh, moisture saving strategy. So we conclude then that particularly elevated temperature and drought can suppress pollinator visits and really mess with the balance uh, between plants and pollinators. All right, let's wrap it up. And there is variation in the literature for some of these responses and I didn't have really time to delve into all of that. But we can, I think, generally conclude that elevated CO2 is likely going to increase legume forage accumulation, nitrogen fixation, and tissue levels of non-structural carbohydrates. Also, it's likely to reduce nitrogen concentration in those tissues. Drought is, may have some effect on forage availability, but it's, or, but it, it, yes, I should say drought reduces forage availability. Its effects on nutritive value are not as consistent. Elevated temperature is really one of our main drivers of nutritive value. The most consistent responses are found there. And we also observed that when elevated CO2 is accompanied by elevated temperature, some of the effects of elevated CO2 in terms of positive impacts in forage accumulation and nitrogen fixation are diminished. We observed that climate change factors can affect pollen availability, pollinator behavior, and likely have some impact on legume reproductive success. And to wrap it all up then, I would state that the effects of climate change and factors on forage legumes can be generalized and predicted to an extent, but there are definitely interactions among climate change factors and with local environments that may confound our predictive ability. So with that, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and attention. And if I have time, I'm happy to try to answer any questions that you might have. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sonnenberger. We do have time for questions, so please, if you have questions. Ben. Um, in your pollinator data, um, I know you were talking about one legume species, but um, were there other legumes that uh, you reviewed that 
had similar responses or you're just summarizing that one? It, apparently there, there is one, just one brave research group uh, in the world that I found that was willing to uh, venture into that area of research. So I looked, um, it may be there and it, it escaped my effort and Dr. Coleman's effort, but, but we did not find them. If others know of them, I'm happy to, to uh, be informed of that. I think Betsy had a question. Yeah, I, I had another slide in there with C4 grasses, but I couldn't do it because I didn't have enough time. But, uh, you know, I, I think the response is, is actually uh, fairly similar in the, the extent that it increases the competitiveness of, of the legume and the nitrogen becomes the limiting factor for, for the grass. The elevated CO2 can, can drive increasing carbon uh, accumulation. The question of C3 and C4, I actually you know, think this, the C4 may be a little better protected in that environment. There's a lot of, lot of work with perennial ryegrass and so on where you know, it's taking a pretty significant hit in terms of legume competition under elevated CO2 because it's running out of nitrogen. And we have data with Bahia grass that shows it runs out of nitrogen as well under conditions of elevated CO2 if, and, and it's very nitrogen fertilizer rate dependent. Time for one quick question while you load the presentation. Dr. Lambeck, if you want to take this. Thank you. Great talk. I was wondering if there were any long-term studies in the papers you found, if there was an effect of time on your elevated CO2 um, ability to fix nitrogen, yeah. Okay, so, so I guess long term may be in the eye of the beholder uh, because of the challenges associated with cre creating an elevated CO2 environment and the expense associated with it. Uh, long term in that case may be a couple of years, uh, but we definitely see, uh, you know, with, with the legume, the, the absence or at least of the degree of acclimation that we associate with other categories of, of C3 plants. So. Thank you, Dr. Salenberg. Another round of applause. <laughs> well, um, I'll be doing the next uh, talk. Uh, so for those of you that don't know me, I'm, I'm Jose Dubé, I'm professor of forage agronomy at the University of Florida, based on North Florida Research and Education Center in Mariana. All right, the Anthropocene, what's that? Is everybody familiar with that word? <laughs> it's also called the, the human epoch. Uh, there is an unprecedented uh, spike on, on human population. If you guys have seen, you know, that uh, get a, the thousand year history of human population, the next, the last 150 years or so, there was a big spike. Uh, and that is creating a lot of pressure on the natural resources. The result of that is uh, loss of biodiversity. Like um, the last talk, we are increasing uh, greenhouse gas in the, in the atmosphere. Uh, it's getting warmer, climate change, more frequent uh, weather extremes like uh, floods or, or droughts. And on top of all that, uh, there is an increase in food demand. There are more people, and more people need to eat more. <laughs> so you need to produce more food, and at the same time, tackle those issues that uh, you can see here. So the challenge is really to produce more food using less resources and reduce all those environmental uh, issues that we're talking here. So the concept of sustainable intensification is not new, it's been around for some time. But at the end, we need to deliver more ecosystem services per unit of resource input. And when I talk about ecosystem services, it's not only beef or milk, but also carbon sequestration, pollinator habitat, and all of those things. 
So the question is, how forage legumes uh, can help us to face that challenge? Um, there's a list of things that I don't need to read everything. Everybody's well versed on those topics. Uh, uh, and I'm gonna go uh, through those, um, some of those things today uh, to, to make the case that I think the forage legumes are a good option to, to help us to navigate through the Anthropocene that now everybody knows what it is. <laughs> first things first, uh, and, and I agree with uh, Bob, you know, um, they need to persist, right, Bob? Uh, and uh, I, when I, you know, finished my PhD, got back to Brazil, and I, you know, I, all that science that I learned at the University of Florida, I learned that uh, we need nitrogen to grow plants. And there are, you know, two main ways to do it. Put a nitrogen fertilizer or introduce forage legumes. Nitrogen fertilizer was quite expensive during that time, and it still is. Um, so, well, let's go to the legume road. And then uh, we tried different herbaceous and, and arboreal legumes to see, okay, let's, let's see what works here. And um, so all of those that you see there, so uh, those are pictures from, from one of my tribes when I was back there in Brazil, Calopogonius, Tylosantis. We, we tried all of those things, Pueraria, um, Citrosema, Clitoria. After two years, they were all gone, except um, the Arrakis. We also planted the Arrakis, and Arrakis was, it persisted there. Well, um, those unknown legumes, or not unknown, but uh, those legumes that don't persist much, I think they have a niche in the integrated crop livestock system, as, as Bob already mentioned. And I, I, you know, my focus will be more on the tropics and subtropical regions. And I know the clover is an odd story, and clover can perennate in some areas, but uh, in our region, in North Florida, it's pretty much you need to plant every year but it's also an option to the cool season. But yes, in Brazil, I think those, even those legumes, Bob, that are crowd farming, they could have a place, a niche in the um, integrated crop livestock systems. So the persistence uh, that uh, Bob already mentioned, Arax pintoi, Arax uh, desmodium, but I also have Arax glabrata that is very popular uh, in Florida and is also very persistent. Um, Dr. Salambert has some fields that are how old? The fields were 40 years, maybe? Over 40 years old on the grazing uh, in Florida with Farax glabrata. So it's a pretty tough legume. Once we established, it's going to stay there. Um, there is another option. Um, if you want to go bigger, <laughs> you, you, you can have the uh, tree legumes, the arboreal legumes. Uh, and uh, like I said at the beginning of my program back there, I also you know, tried to, to select some of those. And, and those two, Glyricida and Mimosa, were uh, a good fit for the systems there. Actually, when, once they're established, the grass is the weak link. You need to be careful with the grass because it might disappear. Um, so again, biological nitrogen fixation is key. It's a key role of our legumes uh, in grassland ecosystem. For me, it's one of the top priorities when I think about a legume. I think the first thing is biological nitrogen fixation. And uh, I think of course, it, it, it varies with different legumes and management, and, and, and mainly proportion of the legumes in the botanical composition. If you have more legumes, you have more biological nitrogen fixation. Uh, and uh, that, that data came from Luana Queiroz, she's here, uh, from Florida, different on-farm trials. You know, it's just simple. More legumes, more biological nitrogen fixation. At least 30% is the number that we try to, to get. And that's some uh, more examples from Brazil uh, where there's a good correlation between legume biomass and uh, nitrogen fixation. The range of fixation varies a lot, and that's here for the tree legumes. You know, it really depends on the population of those legumes, the management, the ecological regions. But, it, you know, 100 kilograms um, per year, per hectare per year, it would be a, a pretty common number to, to find in the literature. Um, so I think, that, and that varies a lot. And some of those are very successful in different uh, regions of the world, like in Africa or in, in Australia. In, you know, Lukina is a good example there. Uh, and in Brazil, still, we still need to do the, the tree legume revolution. So reduction of carbon footprint, uh, and that's a, a point. We need to do the, the life cycle assessment of the whole system. 
And, and Bob mentioned that uh, legumes can replace nitrogen fertilizer, and nitrogen fertilizer, um, you know, it's produced with um, fossil fuel, natural gas, and has a big carbon footprint. So if you replace um, the fertilizer by, by the legumes, you might have um, a reduction in the carbon footprint. And also, they can help also with the carbon sequestration. I have an example from the tropics. That's a mimosa sesopinifolia, it's a tree legume. This thing grows 10,000 uh, 10, kilograms of dry matter per hectare per year. We measure those, you know, after a long five, 10 year period. So that brings us, you know, if you put 40%, 44%, I put 40, that's four tons of carbon per hectare per year, just on the above ground biomass that is growing. And 9% of those are on branches and timbers, only 10% leaves. Uh, that's equivalent to 3.6 tons of carbon. And if you put in CO2 equivalent, it's 13.2. We didn't measure the roots. I didn't find a brave enough graduate student to measure the roots of those trees. <laughs> but I'm assuming 20% of the biomass below ground. I think that's reasonable to assume, in, you know, based on some numbers. That would give us an additional 2.9. Um, if you sum up with the 13, it's, uh, you know, up to 16 tons. If you, we didn't measure that as well. But uh, getting some data from the literature on the methane, uh, we could go up to five tons of CO2 equivalent. So this is far from being a life cycle assessment, but it's, there's a lot of room there to suggest that this is a sink of carbon. Um, and there is uh, some data here from that same site showing that uh, we have uh, greater uh, Carbon, uh, especially near the tree side, uh, that as we move away, the carbon stock kind of reduces uh, here and here. And that's uh, uh, A is for um, Gulliri seed, and here is for uh, Mimosa. But it's a similar trend with a greater uh, carbon. And uh, they also uh, compared with uh, just uh, signal grass monoculture and the silvopasture system had way more carbon in the soil. Moving forward to nutritive value and, and preference, and now we are moving north to Florida. We have bahia grass and uh, rhizoma peanut here. And uh, as you see, um, digestibility of um, rhizoma peanut is, is way better than, than the one from bahia grass. It's 70% you know, against 45, 50. Uh, crude protein is around 17, 18% against 10, 12. 12 is already on the good side of bahia grass. Uh, and that leads to um, a preference uh, of grazing animals. You see, the, this is the carbon-13 of the fecal samples, and this is the, these are the animals grazing on the perennial peanut bahia grass mix. So that clearly, as, as you go down in this scale, gets more negative. That means more legumes in their fecal samples. So that uh, you know, clearly indicates the preference of those cattle uh, on the, on, on the legumes, on the, on the perennial peanut. And that translates to the uh, performance of those animals. As, as you see here, uh, and, and David Jaramillos showed some of this data in the morning, 74% uh, increase in average daily gain, greater um, gain per area compared to the grass monoculture. Uh, stocking rate a little lower, which is good. We are producing more with less cattle. That means less methane emission per unit of area will be more um, efficient. Uh, so, um, and, and as uh, David showed in the morning, we use less water to produce the same amount of beef. Another example coming from the tropics now, from the arboreal legumes. In this, in this one, we, we compare three different uh, arboreal legumes with uh, signal grass in monoculture. That's Gliricidia signal grass and Mimosa in signal grass. And here, signal grass in monoculture. Average daily gain was better in the signal grass um, gliricidia system, as you can see here. Uh, the stocking rate was similar here, but lower in the mimosa. And the gain per area was better in the gliricidia uh, signal grass system. Uh, the mimosa system, the, the trees were fully developed. Uh, so at the beginning of the system, kind of, there is not a whole lot of difference, but as you move forward and the trees get fully developed, it gets a big competition with the brachiaria. So that, that's a picture, a drawn picture from that system. You see the mimosa system here, you see the competition, especially for water, 
with the um, brachiaria, that's the glycidia, and that's the pure signal gas uh, system. Uh, greenhouse gas emission, Lisa Garcia measured that. There was a big trend here to reduce uh, methane emission intensity as you had uh, more legumes in the system. Uh, and, and Marta also showed that um, nitrous oxide emission was uh, lower uh, in the uh, legume compared to the grass plus nitrogen system, uh, especially because, you know, because of the emissions from the fertilizer, both in the winter and in the summer. Another student uh, did some work with uh, Cerisia lispidiza that has condensed tannins, and we measured the greenhouse gas emission from the, uh, from the excreta. And, and we got some interesting results. We get animals eating no lispidiza, 50% of the diet was lispidiza, the other 50 was grass, Bermuda grass. Here, Bermuda grass, 100%. And this is 100% lispidiza. Uh, so the, the pure grass, is, which is the blue line, end up with a more... Um, Night, uh, fecal N2O emission, at, especially at the beginning, but bigger difference uh, in the urine here. Here is the 100% uh, lispidiza. Uh, you see less emission of uh, nitrous oxide from the urine compared to the grass. Um, so we didn't measure, but there are some suggestions that condensed tannins can be metabolized uh, in, in, in end up, you know, with some hyperic acid in, in the urine, which reduce. Uh, nitrous oxide emission. Some pollinator data as well for, from uh, Lisa Garcia again, showing that uh, we found more bees in the grass uh, legume systems. And you, if you contrast, you know, grass legume versus grass uh, only systems, we also end up with more bees, bees in the uh, grass legume mixture. Dr. Makoviak, not sure if she, she was in the, in the room here, but she's helping us to measure some of the uh, nitrate leaching uh, from those systems. And there was, um, you know, half of the uh, nitrate leaching in the grass legume uh, system in the Bahia grass rhizoma peanut mixture compared to the Bahia grass and nitrogen system. So all of that is indicating us that there is a, you know, a trend for to uh, sustainably intensify the system using forage legumes, right? Um, Litter. Uh, legumes can, can help to improve the, the, the litter quality. Uh, so it, it reduces the, the carbon to nitrogen ratio uh, and that uh, speed up the whole nitrogen cycle in the system. Uh, Dr. Coleman uh, showed some examples of that. As you increase the legume percentage, uh, there is a, you know, a reduction in the uh, lignin to nitrogen ratio and increasing nitrogen uh, in the litter, uh, and a uh, slight reduction in the CN ratio as well. That's another uh, data from, um, from Brazil showing a similar thing with greater litter nitrogen in the Brachiaria umidicula desmodium ovalifolium. And that uh, also uh, led to, to greater um, decay rates. That's another legumes, in this case, Scalopogonium conoids. As you increase, as you add legume in the mixture, in the litter, uh, there is a greater uh, decay rate. Uh, and that uh, results, uh, again, another uh, work from Dr. Coleman, uh, showing that as we increase the proportion of legumes uh, in the litter, there is a greater uh, decay uh, rate. Uh, this is a remaining nitrogen uh, in, in the, in the um, bag. Uh, and, and it decreases. Uh, that, that tells that uh, there is a, a faster uh, nitrogen mineralization rate uh, for the legumes. I'm getting towards the end. I have a couple more slides. Uh, this uh, came from Bruno uh, Grossi uh, and, and Bob's group, actually, from, from Brazil. It's a nitrogen cycle uh, in grass legume mixtures. And here you have the biological uh, nitrogen fixation. Then you have the pools and, and the flows of nutrients. I'm not going to go through all that, but I want you to, um, to take a look here at this number. At the end, there was a net gain of nitrogen in this grass legume system. Uh, they also have another uh, system with just monoculture grass without legume and without nitrogen fertilizer. And in that one, there was a loss of uh, around 40 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year. So that shows that the legume really helps to sustain the system without, you know, and reducing the, the nitrogen input. Uh, 
uh, Roger Trump uh, helped me to put together uh, this uh, figure, also compare the nitrogen fertilized grass in grass legume mixture uh, from some of our data, we're trying to, to fill the gaps. We still have a few gaps here in this figure that we're trying to address in our research program, but I uh, don't have much time, but I want you to focus on the last line here, which is gain of uh, live weight per kilogram of nitrogen input. So in the nitrogen uh, system, nitrogen fertilized system, it was around 2.8 kilogram of um, um, live weight per kilogram of, of nitrogen input. And in the legume system, it was around almost you know, 7.5 or 8, uh, 7.6 uh, kilogram of uh, live weight per kilogram of nitrogen input. For me, that's sustainable intensification. Uh, the the nit nitrogen cycling in the grass legume mix is, is much more efficient than uh, in nitrogen fertilized systems. So take home message, uh, yes, I think forage legumes are key components of sustainable livestock systems. Uh, and, and that sustainable intens intensification can reduce the carbon footprint of those systems. Um, and there are still some bottlenecks uh, for adoption. I think the seed, in the case of the tropics, is a, is a key component of that. And uh, arboreal legume, although has been a, uh, successfully adopted in Africa and in some areas in Southeast Asia and in Asia. In Brazil, is not there yet, so we need to work on the outreach. And I want to thank all my uh, co-workers, all my students, the forage team, all the colleagues, and, and the great group of people that put all, all of this together. Without them, it would not be possible to do. Thank you very much. For my time now, <laughs> <laughs> I guess we have time for a couple of questions so that you can finish. Jim. What, what is the greatest challenge that you feel as facing the intensification, intensified use of legumes and pastures today? Right. A very good modulator of that is the nitrogen price of fertilizer. When it goes down, when, when it goes up, like it, it did, you know, a big spike last year, I got a lot of extension calls. How can you get more legumes? How can you put legumes to work on my field? <laughs> and then as the nitrogen fertilizer goes, goes down, so they, they don't worry much about that. So I think that's a big thing here in US at least. Uh, in the tropics, I think there are other bottlenecks. I mean, the price is big and, and at the end nobody does not even the legume, not even the fertilizer, they don't do anything. But the, I think if you come up with a, developing a seed um, industry uh, and uh, reduce the, the price of the seed and availability, I think that would be key. Magna. Right. <laughs> well, it, you can play with different things, including the spacing. The first trial that you did for those three legumes, you put like 10 uh, meters apart and planted in double rows. That was too close. Then that one that I showed was 15 meters apart, and then it was still too close. Uh, Dr. Alexandre established another system with 25 meters apart, and it, it seems to be working well. But it really depends also on, on, on what, what do you want from the legume, uh, because that one that I was competing with the grass, uh, there is a big income coming from the timber uh, production. Uh, it's, it's, you know, probably, you know, greater gain, economic gain than the, the cattle 
itself. So maybe you know it's okay to you know manage with, uh, animals at, at the you know first four years after harvesting, after establishing, and then reduce the stocking rate because you're still gonna get a lot of uh, gains from from the from the timber sale. Um, but if your focus is just the, the cattle, so maybe you need to pick another legume. So the I guess it, it's a complex sensor, uh, but uh, yes, there are different pieces that you can uh, manage in the system to address that. Yes, sir, Andre. We are a bit over time, so you guys feel free to, to leave, but but it's okay, yeah. We don't have any sessions after that, so. Thank you. Right. Uh, the first thing is to, to get them there, right, and, and then make sure that they stay there. And second, of course, you need to refine those. I've been a lot of, uh, I think another thing that is different today, at least in Brazil, I can talk about that. We, we built a capacity. We, we built a lot of, uh, you know, um, the universities, Embrapa, all of those folks. There is a lot of young, you know, people working on, on and addressing this issue. So we need to refine, and for example, uh, Brachiaria and Arax Pintoi is an example, and there are groups, you know, working, uh, trying to refine the management, you know, the, the light interception, interception, the stubble height, and, and things like that, you know, to, to, to fine-tune the system. But uh, the first thing is establish and make sure that they stay there, and then you need to refine, but I think we have built capacity in the last few years, in the last decade or so, yeah. Miguel. Yeah, that's, that's a great um, question, and uh, there are different ways to transfer that nitrogen from the legume to the grass. If it's a grazing system, uh, you know, it, it, it's excreta, you know, dung and urine or, or litter. Those are the main two uh, pathways, and, and that you can modulate that as you change the stocking rate and, and grazing pressure. The more animals, more is going to come through the excreta. More are going to be le the losses, though, but it's maybe more readily available. The less we graze, the more it will come through litter. Uh, but uh, what we found with our numbers of, you know, we have a system, with, it's not long term, but it's already eight years. Uh, so it's, uh, if you put together the, the, the input of nitrogen in the legume system, it's less than what you're putting in the fertilizer system. But at the end, you produce similar gains or with a trend to produce even more. So that suggests there is a way, you know, more efficient uh, cycling, nitrogen cycling in that in that uh, legume. It's like a slow release fertilizer, like you have a little decaying over time. It's different than applying fertilizing. You know, when it's raining, when it's hot, a lot of that's going to be lost. Uh, so it seems that um, my whole rule of thumb, thumb is uh, for for every kilogram of nitrogen from fertilizer, it's equivalent to two to three kilograms of nitrogen via biological nitrogen fixation. That's, so it's not a straight number. It's, uh, I'm not sure, Bob, if you want to comment on that, but that's, that's the number that I, I've been ob observing. Right, so it's it's a it's a around two to three. Yeah, I think we can get 150 kilos from those legumes. Right. And that would be two three hundred kilos of nitrogen. Yeah. Normally, you know, we've got firm figures of 100, 100 kilos from nitrogen fixation, a little over, uh, compared to 150 or so from the 
right. And if you have the opportunity to overseed, you know, like we have in the subtropical regions with clover, then that's a win-win because you have the, the summer legume and then you have the, the cool season legume also helping fixing some nitrogen. Yeah, so I, I think per year, we go right. Year. Yeah. We are over time and I think we <laughs> I think you guys have, you know, other things to do. So I, I want to thanks all the speakers uh, for the great session and, and thanks for everybody here.